before, before we start, I just want to say one book that I would commend for those of you who are very interested in what we've talked about tonight is uh, Doug Sweeney's upcoming book from InterVarsity Press, Jonathan Edwards and the Ministry of the Word. Dr. Sweeney sparked a lot of my thought on this topic, which is why I proposed this event, and I would just commend it to you. It's coming out soon. The Henry Center booth has flyers for it, and uh, Doug will get your heart fired up either for theological pastoral ministry or scholarly ministry. So look for that book um, in days to come. Because you both questioned the use of scholar in, in the event title, um, I just wanted to say what I was, what I was thinking in, in offering that title and then have you respond. In the past, it seems to me that theology was done for the church. There is certainly and always will be a place for high-level academic theology, theology among the experts. But it seems to me that in the past, men like Augustine, uh, Luther, Calvin, Edwards, Warfield, many others we could name, the Puritans, thought of themselves as theologians of the highest level, but for the church. So they weren't doing, they weren't writing books just to be smart in the way that you kind of talked about a few minutes ago, Dr. Carson. They were writing to build up and edify the church and draw lost people to the beauty of the Christian faith in the way that you write about Dr. Dr. Piper. That's what I was thinking of when I proposed this. You could, you could substitute theologian for scholar, and you could, again, add that tagline for the church. Is that something that makes sense? Does that um, help clarify the two callings? Um, no. <laughs> Be because because there, there are different levels at which you can do that. I mean, if you take Jonathan Edwards' um, Nature of True Virtue, the, it was written for the sake of the church, but I doubt that any lay people have gotten much help from it at all. Um, and so that's what I mean by their different levels. You take his religious affections, that's another level. Yeah. They're both powerful books, but one has zero scripture in it and is talking about consent to being. What in the world is consent to being? And it is a, it is a, he's just operating at a cutting-edge philosophical response level. So I, I think that's okay to do that. There should be people who do that. Not me. Um, I'm going to do religious affections level. So the, the reason it would be uh, harder to say, the reason that didn't help me is because uh, if you were to ask me, are you one of those, I, I just have to make distinctions again. Okay. Did you, uh... Yes. Um, I, th I think that there is another factor that's being left out. Um, at, at many occasions in the history of the church, the most learned person around, uh, not only in the church, but also in the entire society, was the pastor. And, and um, un until the explosion of knowledge, too, in the latter half of the evangelical awakening, of, of the... Of, of, of the uh, um, uh, the um, Enlightenment. Um, it, w w they, 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 were, um, they were thinkers who learned so many things on so many fronts. The, the, the pastor was an exegete, but was also studying some biology. And, and they, they were the most knowledgeable people around. And, and so one of the reasons why you got so many unconverted people that, that wanted to be pastors was because this was also a path toward the life of learning. But, but eventually, the the... The, the, the place of, of learning was not in pastoral ministry, it, 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 it was in the university, or it, 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 it was in a secular approach to knowledge and this sort of thing. And the pastor becomes someone who's working with a narrower sphere, and, and, and then you had the breakup of the great evangelical institutions, um, s such that you had more and more people getting their theological training in minor Bible institutes and things like that. And the, the, the whole life of the mind for, for a, a hundred years, was, was less and less well treated in the North American context with some remarkable exceptions un until you, you, you had the founding of the great evangelical institutions and, and the revitalizing of, of all of them again, starting with Fuller in 1947 and, 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 and so forth. Uh, Trinity, for all of its strength, started as a seminary really in 1961. That, 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 that's it. 
And, and um, John was right to say that there was a generation in there that, that, that was the transitional generation, that w w was far more lonely. Um, uh, there, there, there were not many of these front rank thinkers alone. Uh, along, they, 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 they just weren't there. So in the 1950, the number of front rank evangelical commentaries around, it, written in English, they, they were pathetic. There, there were just almost nothing there. They, they were semi-pop things. F.F. Bruce? F.F. Bruce, that was about it. And he'd written a few. And After you said F.F. Bruce, well, you could say F.F. Bruce. I mean, there, there, there wasn't, RVG Task was doing little Tyndale bits, but there was just nothing there. And, and so people look back with nostalgia to the great days of F.F. F. Bruce. Where is a scholar standing head and shoulders above everybody like F.F. F. Bruce? Well, I'll tell you why he stood head and shoulders above. There was nobody else to stand above. And he, he was a great scholar in many ways, but, but, but there was no competition. Now, nowadays, there are many who have the capacity of an F.F. F. Bruce because of an F.F. F. Bruce. Right. Do, 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 do you see? And, and so the, 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 for all of the fact that there's all kinds of decline in the West and all kinds of moral in other areas, that, that, that's true. Nevertheless, in the area of biblical theological scholarship, all, I know it's mixed and it's compromised and all the rest, but there's great grounds for encouragement too. Huge things for which to be thankful. And nowadays, there's a major crisis coming along in the church in some area, and there are going to be some Christians that are going to be addressing it, thinking it through. I, I, that's wonderful, you know? So I, I, I don't think it's, it's those sorts of who's a pastor, who's a scholar, and where the drifts are. I've, I've just be, been, been turning on one thing, like writing for the church. Or I think it's turned a lot of, of, of things, sociological and, and our history and, and so forth. Okay, one pushback. Um, Edwards is a divine and supernatural light. Uh, or heaven is a world of love. Um, or many other sermons, are some of the, the richest, most theologically astute sermons you could find. It's some of the most beautiful writing in the English language, I think, and I'm, I'm guessing you might agree. Um, there, he, he obviously has a brilliant mind, so I'm not thinking we should all go and try to be like him and write like him, but he is doing theological work in those sermons in a way that I wonder if many pastors can't try to do. Mm -hmm. Not to try to be smart right. um, and not get degrees to try to look good, but to push their minds, challenge themselves, and do that kind of theology for the church. Yeah. And to have academic theologians who write high-level theology, who engage in their own conversations, but who also, in a very Edwardsian way, write for the church as well. Does that make more sense? Is that the kind of thing we could emulate? Well, I totally, amen, amen. So Z, that, that doesn't sound like pushback. That sounds like agreement. So I'm, I'm, I love that. That's what I would like to call, I mean, to do, th do that as much as you can do it and, yeah. and, and grow in your, in your capacities. Learn Greek if you can, learn Hebrew if you can, and be as meditative on 2 Corinthians 4, 4 to 6 as you can. I mean, Edwards was able to do that because he could look at that in... The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. He saw that and he saw worlds of implication. So that's what, that's what I want. I, mean, I want. I want people to see that. So it does take, um, I, I don't know if the word scholarly, I like theological better, uh, um, a breadth, a breadth of awareness of what's been said in other parts of the scripture that are coming to bear on that as you read it. It also takes an unusual, imaginative, penetrating mind to take every one of those words, light of gospel, of glory, of Christ, who is, in every one of those words, you, you gotta see through, and the more theological you are, the more vast the worlds are that open with each of those words. So we, we want meditative, reflecting, long staring at the text type thinkers. So thinking is what, is what I'm after in, if I'm trying to beget theological pastors, is take a text and think deeply about it. Helps if you can go through the Greek and Hebrew, helps if you know other parts of scripture, but go deep, penetrate through and think your, your way through and then put it all back together in a synthetic way and then do the divine and supernatural light sermon. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> I mean, there's a sense in which I agree entirely. But, 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 just, but just one sense. Yeah. 
the, 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 the but is we're not all Jonathan Edwards. So some people who simply try to emulate him eventually try to build a systematic theology out of each word and then lose what the local text actually says. It's methodologically flawed. They think they're doing what Edwards did, but they don't have his skills. And so you, you want at the same time to throw in other things as well and to recognize differences and give some grace, even while, yeah, I do want people to be working to their full capacity as theologians and so forth. How come you can say, you know, three minutes worth and I'm restricted to one sentence? I don't think it was that way with the last question. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> no, I don't think so. My final question for you, and then we're going to go to text and Q&A. Um, if a, let's focus on pastors for a minute. If a pastor heard your talks, um, synthesized them, caught a vision for what you've been talking about tonight in, what we, in the way that we were just talking about with Edwards, a kind of Edwardsian, richly theological ministry. How can a young pastor act on this kind of vision? And how can a pastor who is already situated, perhaps middle-aged, doesn't have a lot of opportunity to go and get further training or that sort of thing, how can those two groups uh, embody this vision, come to embody it? The two groups again? Young, young guy, training for the ministry, and older, older pastor. <clears throat> At the risk of being a smart aleck, um, read a great deal less on the internet and a great deal more of books. Now, don't misunderstand. I mean, I'm not knocking the internet. You know, in the Gospel Coalition, we've just pushed a big thing there, and, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful tool. But, but it's such a scrappy environment. You, you know, you're not, you're not learning to think, unless you're downloading entire books from the internet and reading them on the screen. I've got no objection to that. Um, believe it or not, I have a Kindle too, and I, 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 I can read St. Augustine on my Kindle. But, 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 but at the same time, there's a way of just collecting little bits and pieces here and there that don't train you to think well. Um, and in that connection, you have to read and reread the Bible, but it needs to be read within the context of the history of the church, of, 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 of historical theology, of others who, believe it or not, some people have studied these texts before you, you, you know? And, and it's worth finding out what they have to say as well. Um, you don't have to keep reinventing everything. You have to f learn to find things for yourself. And you, your authority really must be the way you start and end there. But at the same time, you must become informed by, by how others before you have, have wrestled with these things and they become your teachers and so on. And that requires um, sustained thought. So in the context of pastoral ministry, reserve time in the study. Not just for preparing for the next sermon, but for reading beyond that. You just have to block out time for that. And if you're going to be a technical scholar, then again, you have to reserve time for, for learning, for reading, for thinking. And um, so much more could be said. And beyond that, also for praying and adoring and all the rest. But you have to reserve time for that and not just sacrifice everything to the urgent uh, demand of the next email. <clears throat> Number one, when you go to school or out of school, don't choose classes, choose teachers. Yep. Find the teachers who do it, model it best, and, and take as many classes as you can. It doesn't matter what they teach. I say that about college, and I'd say it about seminary. Don't take classes, take teachers. Ask around, find out who is the thinker, the modeler. Number two, not only don't read internet as much as books, read fewer books and read them with pencil in hand and read them very slowly and underline and write questions in the margin and say, no, it doesn't agree with, path chapter, uh, with page 22 and, and then go to page 23 and, and argue, get inside and think and argue with a book. Number, number three, find a group of men, this may be the pastors already out there, who love to do this with you and uh, get together and read critically some book like, like that. And... Um, Read Mortimer Adler, How to Read a Book. No matter what age you are, if you haven't read that book, Mortimer Adler, How to Read a Book, it's 90 years, 60 years old as, as a book, and it will show you how to do reading. Most people do not know how to read. I would venture to say most people in this room do not know how to read because reading is an unbelievably non-passive, active affair when you, when you do it. And we've been taught by teachers assigning us 12 books in a class not to read. We've been taught not to read. 
We think that moving through passages is reading. It's not reading. Interacting so that you can restate an author's thought, can reconstruct his argument to his satisfaction, and then give reasons. And there are kinds of reasons you can give. He was inadequate in the way he described. He was incomplete. He was illogical. He drew wrong inferences. You need to learn the kinds of ways you can interact. Do the same thing then with the Bible. So there is a way, what, what I'm talking about is learning how to think. Think and observe. Think and observe. What you do is observe what's there and think rightly about it. So the, the fetal pig and geometry. That's what it's about. So wherever, wherever you, you can find somebody to just train you to do that, do it. Isaac Watts, mainly known for what? Hymns. But he wrote a primer on logic. Why would that be? Because you can't understand the theology you build the hymns on unless you think rightly. So the poet and the logician. Thank you. We have just a few minutes for texting questions. I'm going to Get them up here and I'll read them to you too. Oh, they're here. They're everywhere. <laughs> what are some of the biggest issues you think the church and evangelical scholars will need to deal with in the next 20 years? And let's, let's say, let's do a lightning round. Let's do quick answers if we can. Yeah. Islam, Christology, is Jesus the only way? That's where I'd start. Continuing challenges in epistemology, that is, uh, uh, how, how do you know the truth? Uh, the place for revelation and understanding all of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're, gonna, you're doing a big two-volume thing on Scripture, because even though he was instrumental a generation ago to write serious things on the authority and inspiration of the Scripture, it needs to be done again because of how many people in new ways challenge the authority of Scripture. So every generation needs its big book, on that, Don's working on that. That'll be, that'll be there for 20 years to come, probably. Um, we are not yet through uh, the debates about justification and the exact place of substitutionary atonement in the structure of biblical thought. There's going to be more. And that one comes again every generation as well in one fashion or another. Uh, You've got to keep redoing that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, go, go ahead. No, uh, no. Add to that the doctrine of God. And that, that's partly because of a whole lot of other things. But one of the most neglected doctrines, I think, in evangelical world is the doctrine of God. We just haven't spent enough time thinking that through holistically. Yeah. Clusters of family issues yep. in relation to the public life and whether you will be allowed without going to jail to stand up in your pulpit and say that homosexuality is, is sin or to spank your children um, or to say that my wife should submit to me. This, this whole cluster of practical family things will, will become volatile more than they are now. You, you see what's happening in Canada, you see what's happening in, in Sweden and other places and, and will we'll, we'll be there and I, I've told people I'm, I will be in jail rather than not preach that it's right to spank your children. I will go to I will not not preach that in order to stay out of jail. I, I will not even use the phrase so-called gay marriage without putting the word so-called in front. It frustrates me that we have, be, we have bought the phrase because there is no such thing as so-called gay marriage. It doesn't exist in the universe. Why evangelicals would start using the term is a sellout. Stick the word so-called in front of it every time you use it because there is no such thing. That, that, will be called, that, that will be called hate speech, and it will be worthy of imprisonment around the corner. And related to that are the pastoral, theological, personal, definitional issues surrounding what tolerance is. Um, and and th that, that is tied to some historical questions. There, there have been shifts in what tolerance is perceived to be, but it's also tied to what you think the church's relationship to culture should be. There is a nest of, of issues related to that where it's going to be important to think very clearly. As, as we're, be, we're being painted into a corner um, uh, and being called intolerant uh, in a very intolerant way. And yet people don't see just how deeply ironic and tragic and even stupid that is. But, but nevertheless, that's what's happening. And, and th th this has to be addressed, I'm afraid. There's one, one more. Um. 
I, th I think that the explosion of, um, I, I don't want to just say contemporary worship music and contemporary worship forms, and, and our church would feel that way to most people, but a, a, a very, uh, a very rock-oriented, so almost everywhere in the world now that we have, we have the same songs, whether or not the ethos generally associated with that on a Sunday morning can sustain the gravitas of the glory of God over the long haul. Whether it can hold it. It, it is possible. I mean, there are contemporary worship songs that, can, that, that draw out my heart into the bigness of God in a most marvelous way. But there is a kind of lowbrow, hip, cool, y'all come, family, a chatty way of doing worship today. The question is, if, if that becomes more and more prevalent, what becomes of the majesty of God in this book? It's very difficult to maintain a sense of the bigness and the majesty of God if everything about the service is calculated to be chummy and close and warm and touchy and feely and y'all come. So there, there's some, something's got to break there. And uh, I, I think, I pray what will happen is that all the best of contemporary worship music and, and all the best of the weightiness of glory will, will, will move and adjust forms so that young, your people, your age, you look 20-somethings, um, will, will, will feel that sooner rather than later and, and you won't overreact against contemporary and say, you know, we're going to go liturgical and old hymns and organ and just try to do it all old again. But rather you'll say, we, we've got to find a way so that from the beginning to the end of this service, there's a weightiness about it, a seriousness, because that corresponds then to what the Word will, will say and who He is and the, what hell really signifies and how glorious the cross is. All those realities just don't fit in talk shows. They, they, they don't. If you try to do your little talk show down there as you welcome people and please just make this as street-like as possible, there are realities, most of them here, just don't fit there. They don't. They get so dumbed down that the, the weight of hell and the horror of judgment and the glory of the cross, it's just people lose their capacity for all. May I add a footnote, even though, you know, a, a sentence? You're asking me? <laughs> yeah. um, yes, you may. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I am 63, after Yeah, all. that's right. You've you got to respect your olders. I mean, what, what can you say? Um, um, I, I agree with that absolutely 100%. Uh, I think that practically in the local church, one of the questions that those who are responsible for sung worship can ask themselves is not just... What is orthodox? But what is best? There are lots and lots and lots of songs that are individually acceptable. But learn to choose what's best, not what passes a mere orthodoxy test. That will already change everything. And then start looking around for certain writers. I w I, two weeks ago I was in England and I sat down again with both Stuart Townend and Keith Getty and his wife, they're, they're friends. Keith and his wife, believe it or not, spent part of their honeymoon in our home. I mean, how stupid can you get? But nevertheless, they did. And, 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 and you know what these people do every time some of us get together at some of these things? They sit down and they, they, they ask questions like, what doctrines are we not hitting adequately in our hymns? What should the tone be? I mean, there, there are some people out there that are doing this right. The, the Stuart Townens and the Keith Gettys of this world are just a cut above almost all the, the other contemporary hymn writers. Pray for more of those. Um, th there are some people making the right moves. I'm, I'm encouraged by, by, by that. All right. Wow. That was quick indeed. I think that was... <laughs> May I encourage you to exercise authority? Yes. <laughs> Over us? Can, I, can we do one last question? You may. All right. <laughs> I guess that wasn't, a good, that wasn't a good exercise of authority, I asked no, no, you. But. No, no. He cannot not exercise authority. <laughs> <laughs> last question, and then um, we're going to have Jackson Crum come up and close the night for us. All things being equal outside of scholarship, does scholarship bring a deeper intimacy and love for God than those who lack scholarship? It's a good question to close on. 
Does scholarship bring a deeper intimacy and love for God than those who lack scholarship? All things being equal is a very crucial qualifier. And if scholarship means right thinking and right observation, the answer is clearly yes. Exactly. But if scholarship means something like being an academic without reference to whether or not your yes. subject matter is right, your disciplines are right, your focus is right, your motives are right, then the answer is it can be merely deceptive and lead you straight to hell. Amen. Let's, let's applaud our speakers.